I want to talk about a religious group that was at the time of Christ, but they were also a political group. They were religious, but they were, well, they were wealthy, they were elite. They held a majority in the Sanhedrin. They were all high priests. In fact, high priests were all from this group. And we call them the Sadducees. And what I want to do is I want to show you why they are called the Sadducees. They were sad, you see. And the reason is because we find this in the 18th verse of the 12th chapter. Then some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Now the question was designed to trap Jesus. It was a question that they used to trap the Pharisees. And it always worked. Now they were going to trap Jesus with the same made up story. And this is the way it goes. Teacher, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her and he died. Nor did the he leave any offspring and the third, and I'm thinking when I'm reading this, what is she cooking? Maybe they should have gone to In-N-Out or something. And then he goes on to say, so the seven had her and left her no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. And then the question, therefore, in the resurrection, which by the way, they did not believe, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. That was the question that stumped the Pharisees. This was the question designed to stump Jesus. And so this is what we read. And Jesus answered, you are mistaken because you do not know the scriptures let me just pause here to say this. The only scriptures that the Sadducees believed in were the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. And Jesus say, you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. And then he said, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. I remember one preacher happened to be reading this passage of scripture and some lady kind of whispered under her breath, oh, that will be glory for, I guess she wasn't getting along with her husband. <laughs> A Sunday school teacher asked the class one time, what does Jesus say about marriage? And some boy got up and he said, uh, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> Jesus goes on and says, have you not read in the book of Moses, it's your book, the book that you believe in, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When God spoke out of the bush, those three were dead, they had died. And so Jesus says, he's the God of the living, not the dead. Do you think that God is the God of a corpse? No, God is the God of the living. And so the Pharisees never heard it this way. And for the first time, they who trapped Jesus discovered they were in their own little trap. The voice of God coming from the bush should have had some effect on the Sadducees because his voice is so powerful that a deaf person can hear him say, be open. And his voice is so powerful that a dead man could hear him say, Lazarus, come forth. There's something interesting about voice. Uh, Caruso's voice, they tell us, could shatter glass. Demosthenes, a Greek orator, 
He spoke so loud that you could hear his voice one mile away. I think of that and I think about my voice, which is so soft that when I go to McDonald's and put in an order, they always say, what? I would not make a good John the Baptist. But the voice of God, the voice, there's something so powerful about the voice of God by the words of God, Hebrews 11, chapter, verse three, the words of God penetrated the entire universe and in one split second there was light. That's God's voice. And when I think about that, I think that what we need to do is to let God's voice penetrate our fears, penetrate our doubts. What is his voice? His voice was fear not, fear not, be not afraid. We need to let that voice penetrate. And his voice, and sometimes we read through the scriptures and we read over the scriptures so quickly we don't really stop to think about what the voice means when he said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's his voice. So his voice needs to penetrate our doubts. His voice needs to penetrate our insecurities. His voice needs to penetrate our frustrations. We have them. His voice needs to penetrate our disappointments and our discouragements and our hurts. That's what his voice, his voice has been given to us for that purpose. Now let his voice do this. In John, Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'm coming back to where I am. There you may be also. That's the message of resurrection. There is a resurrection coming, Jesus taught it. The Sadducees, not only did not believe in a resurrection, they did not believe in miracles. In fact, it's interesting, this religious group, they were a religious group, but they were so elite and so far left, they didn't believe anything that Moses wrote, but they believed Moses. That's strange. They didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in spirits, they didn't believe in resurrection, they didn't believe in miracles. And yet Moses, yet Moses wrote, Sarah had been barren all of her life, and at the age of 90, when she was beyond the time of childbearing. She gave birth to Isaac. That's a miracle. Moses also says that manna came from the sky when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were hungry from the sky. That's a miracle. Miracle. Manna comes down to feed them. And he said the miracle of water coming out of a rock, that is a miracle. And yet Moses is writing about miracles in his book and the Sadducees who only believe the books of Moses don't believe what he wrote. They didn't believe in miracles. They, 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 they read that the pillar of cloud led them by day and the pillar of fire led them by night. They read that the Red Sea divided, but they... What kind of a strange religion is that when you believe a person but you don't believe what it says? That's the Sadducees. That's why they're sad. They didn't believe. I want to show three illustrations of the resurrection to nature. In a mother's womb, the body is knit together in such a way that thousands of years later, it's still a mystery. How is a baby formed? And a mother's what we don't know. We know what's being done, but we don't understand what's being done. It's a miraculous, but what I want to point is this. I want you to imagine twins, and they're having a conversation. It's made up. One is a believer and one is a non-believer. And the non-believer says to the believer, you know, there's nothing after this. This is it. 
after we leave here, it's over. And the believer says, I don't think so. It seems to me that all this developing that's going on and all this preparation, has, it's got to be, there's got to be a purpose in this. And the non-believer says, no, I, when the umbilical cord is cut, our food supply is cut. And that's a fact. And the fact says, when we're out of here, we're dead. And the believer said, I just got a feeling that there's more to it than this. In fact, I think it won't be long. Soon we'll be leaving here. It won't be long. Soon we're going home. Count the months as weeks. Count the weeks as days. Any day now, we'll be going home. And the unbeliever says, has anyone ever, ever come back to tell us there's life beyond the womb? No. And the reason nobody ever came back to tell us that there's life beyond the womb is because there is no life beyond the womb. But there is. And God made it set in such a way that it helps us understand a little bit something about life after the womb. Life after death. Then there's also the caterpillar. As far as an illustration from nature, the caterpillar, all the caterpillar does all of its life is crawl around on dirt, crawl over rocks, crawl over twigs, crawl over the mud. That's all, his whole life is, is tied to the dirt. Now, I don't know what the caterpillar is thinking because I've never been one, but I can tell you this, but the caterpillar probably thinks, you know, it would be nice to fly. I see birds flying, but I'm crawling around. I don't get it. I wish he, I just have. But the caterpillar dies, crawls into its cocoon, and turns into liquid, dead. But there's a spark that takes place, unbeknownst to the caterpillar. And the caterpillar emerges from the cocoon of butterfly. And the dreams that he had when he was crawling around on the dirt to someday fly becomes a reality. Just like the dreams that we have that this planet of ours is not our resting place, but there's something a little bit more and something beyond this life that we are living will someday come to pass, but first, we die, and then the promise of God. Now, after having said this, I want to bring your attention to the tomb. We talked about the womb, the cocoon, and the tomb. Now, the Sadducees, I mentioned that the Sadducees were the, the majority force in the Sanhedrin. All of the Pharisees were, I mean, the Pharisees, the high priests were all Pharisees, they had a lot of clout, they had a lot of influence. And it was the Pharisees that arranged for Jesus to be arrested, tried, and then crucified. And when Jesus was crucified, it was the Pharisees along with some Pharisees and others, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, came to the cross and they looked up at Jesus and said, if you are Truly, the Son of God, come down and we'll believe. Look at you. You saved others, but yourself, you cannot save. Well, they had guards posted at the tomb to make sure nobody took that body because Jesus had mentioned in three days I'll rise. So these guards were being paid to watch that tomb. 
and then the resurrection. The guards were so frightened by the bright light and the earthquake and the moving of the stone that they ran all the way to the Sadducees to tell them what happened. And this is what the Bible says. The Sadducees gave them what you call hush money to keep them from telling the truth. In fact, the Sadducees gave them a cover story. They said, you just tell people when we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body, which is the stupidest excuse ever, ever given on earth. Think about it. Somebody had to rip off the Roman seal and they slept. Somebody had to move the stone and they slept. Somebody had to go into the tomb and take the body and carry his body out while they slept. And if they were sleeping, how could they know it was the disciples who took the body? That's why what they said was so foolish, and that's why I said these are sad, you see. They told a story that seems ridiculous. But the truth is, he's alive. Now the question is, Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Tell me whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the I think it's a lot easier for us to believe what the Bible says. The evidence is overwhelming, and we're not going to get into that here. But God has given us enough clues in nature as well as in Scripture to help us understand that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. I want you to listen to a song. This is the real story, the story that the Sadducees would have loved to cover up. It's really touching. When I listened to it, it did something. Two girls singing Hallelujah. 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 What does it mean? We know the miracle took place, there was a resurrection, but it has a very practical, down-to-earth, personal meaning. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. If the grave couldn't hold him, the grave can't hold us. That's the hope of the church. That's what we center our faith around. Jesus died, rose again. It's proof that our sins are forgiven. It's proof that God loves us. It's proof he's coming back. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I'm coming back. That where I am, there you may be also. I'm going to close in prayer and then Nancy's going to play a song. I'm going to sing it with her. But I wanted to close the service on this solemn note. We have a hope. God does not paint rose-colored flowers for us. Life is real. Life can hurt. But we still have a hope. Caterpillar proves it. The birth of a child proves it. The empty tomb proves it. Lord, we thank you for the promises that we have that you never leave us. You do not forsake us. 
while we walk through this life, we have promises that you give us. If only we would just look at your word and believe your word and receive your word and let your word penetrate into our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen.